I'm not sure about you have an Arecibo as a backdrop. <laughs> I know, maybe just nostalgic. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Jessica Williams, and I'm the Programs and Community Partnerships Manager at Chabot Space and Science Center. And we are thrilled to bring another exciting program into your homes this evening. Um, we're excited to bring you this in partnership with the SETI Institute. And tonight we have with us Dr. Michael Bush, who will be telling us all about near-Earth asteroids and the impact hazards and space missions. And we are excited to bring you this talk in partnership with the Study Institute. And we have Simon Steele here from the Simon Institute to say a few words. Thank you, Simon, for joining us. Of course. It's nice to see you, Jessica and Michael. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're excited to bring you the ninth in the series of uh, uh, SETI Institute and Shabo Space and Science Center Talks for Families. Um, and uh, all of these talks, including this one later on when it has happened, uh, are available on the SETI Institute's YouTube page and Shabo's YouTube page. So please do take a look back. We've had some very, very uh, exciting talks about lots and lots of different topics related to the research at the SETI Institute. Now, the name SETI is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, but we do so much more than that. Uh, we have scientists researching fossil microbes on Mars. We have scientists searching for exoplanets, planets around other stars. And we have uh, scientists uh, looking into protecting our world in two very, very different ways um, that sound very similar. Uh, one of them is, is called planetary protection. Planetary protection is the uh, protection of the Earth and the protection of other worlds that we explore from invasive microbes. We don't want to take Earth microbes to Mars because that could mess up our experiments, if not something more, and we don't want to bring microbes back to Earth. Uh, and that is planetary protection. Um, there's another uh, hazard that we would like to protect from, and that is the subject of tonight's talk. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand back to you, Jessica and uh, Michael. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. And we're just, we're so enjoying this partnership with the SETI Institute. We're learning so much through these talks for families. And now I would love to introduce to you all our speaker for this evening, Dr. Michael Bush. Um, Michael W. Bush, PhD, is a planetary astronomer and research scientist at the SETI Institute. And his research focuses primarily on studying individual asteroids with radar and radio technique to understand their histories, rule out future Earth impacts, and support space missions. We are so excited to have you, Dr. Bush, and I want to let the audience know that we will be taking questions at the end of the talk, so please be sure to post your questions in the chat. Dr. Bush, thanks for joining us, and take it away. Okay. Hello, everybody. And I, sorry, as always, this past year that I can be over at the Shibo Center in person. I have some slides I'm going to share here. Jessica will be moderating the chat. Please let me know if anything I am saying is entirely incomprehensible or if the slides aren't showing up appropriately, and I'll try to work around that. Probably start at the beginning of the, of the slides. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? Everything working, Jessica? Looks great. Okay. So, as you heard, I am Michael Bush. I usually work over at the City Institute offices in Mountain View. And I mostly study near Earth asteroids, which are this population of objects on their own orbits around the sun that cross or come near the orbits of the Earth. So, this is a chart of the inner solar system out to the orbit of Jupiter. As of one day in 2019, when I grabbed this image from the Minor Planet Center, which is based over in Massachusetts, it's got the job with the International Astronomical Union of keeping track of where everything is. And this is everything out to the orbit of Jupiter as of that one point in time. Earth is here. This is in June. It's April. We're back this way. Jupiter's out here. It's moved along in its orbit some since then. We have the sun in the middle. We have the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Mars in there. And then all the other markers are different small bodies on their own orbits around the sun. There's a lot of stuff. The Minor Planet Center, as of this morning, is keeping track of something over a million different things 
in orbit around the sun. Most of them are main belt asteroids between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Those are the green markers here. There are also the Trojan asteroids, which are those blue clouds in front of and behind the planet. They may not show up so well, depending on your monitor. There are comets passing through, but what I'm gonna focus on in this talk are the red dots. Those are near-Earth asteroids. Now, near-Earth is defined as being on an orbit that comes within 50 million kilometers of the Earth's orbit at some point in its own orbit around the sun. 50 million kilometers is really, really far away as compared to the size of the Earth, which is 8,000 miles, 12,000 some kilometers wide. It's really close as compared to the distance from the Earth to the sun, which is 93 million miles, plus or minus, depending on the time of year, 150 million kilometers. And it's really close as compared to the size of the asteroid belt. Jupiter's orbit is 1 billion miles, one and a half billion kilometers across here. So there's a lot of stuff out there, but it's really, really, really thinly spread through a lot of empty space. The asteroids are many thousands of times smaller than the dots that we use to depict them here. I make this point because it is not like Star Wars. You don't go out in the sky, look every which way, and asteroids are blocking your view. Instead, very thinly spread material some of which happens to be on orbits that cross the orbit of the Earth. Now, the near-Earth asteroids that we see have not been on those orbits forever, and we'll talk about where they go over time. But they need to be constantly replaced, and they're going to be replaced from the main asteroid belt. The reason that they are constantly getting replaced from the ast main asteroid belt is the same reason why there isn't a big planet there, because there's a bunch of small things. It's mostly because Jupiter happened first. We have a disk of material in the early solar system that's orbiting too fast to fall into the sun. And within that disk, things start clumping up. We build up to protoplanets. We build up to in the inner solar system, the terrestrial planets. Out here, Jupiter accumulated so much mass that it also piled on a lot of gas. And it quickly scattered the orbits of everything around it. And the result, when asteroids run into each other into the, the asteroid belt, which does happen, they erode rather than accreting. And you never got a single big planet. And even now, things get their orbits scattered around a bit by Jupiter, and they can fall into the inner solar system. And then we have a new near-Earth asteroid. The consequence of this is that we have all these remnants of planet formation, which are flying around. And if we can study them, we can learn stuff about the history of the solar system, which is cool. And also, conveniently, all these near-Earth asteroids are passing by near the Earth, and they're easier to study. So we have a scientific motivation for studying these things. If we zoom way in, I mentioned how the asteroids do run into each other every so often and they erode. This is a collage of different asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft as well as some comets, but I'm not gonna to talk too much about them tonight. The collage here was done by Emily Lakdawalla while she was at the Planetary Society in Los Angeles. You see here on the left, the asteroid Lutetia, that is for and a half billion years old, the age of the solar system. It's 80 miles, 130 kilometers long. It has not gotten broken apart, but it's come very close to it. You can see it's lost large chunks of its volume. All these smaller asteroids over here, which are main belt asteroids and near Earth asteroids both, are remnants of previous asteroid asteroid collisions. So if we're looking at a single small object now, it's debris from other asteroids running into each other at some point in the past. We have to kind of reconstruct that whole process of events to understand what we're looking at. You also notice the asteroids here aren't round. The very biggest asteroids, Ceres and Vesta in the main asteroid belt, they're big enough that gravity crunches them down into balls. Ceres is the size of Texas or South Africa. It's pretty close to a sphere. Vesta gets a little lumpy. And then everything else, gravity is not strong enough on these things because they're many, many, many times smaller than the Earth and they just can have whatever interesting lumpy shapes. We also get very unusual physics in these environments because the gravity is so low. We don't think of things like electrostatic charge mattering for gravity on the Earth that much, but if the gravity is 10,000, for geology on the Earth, because the gravity is as high as it is, if the gravity is 10,000 times less, you get weird things happening. Electrostatic charge lifting boulders, sorts of things. So it's another reason to study the asteroids. They're just really strange places and we learn new things that we didn't expect. 
I'm going to zoom in now on this dot up here, which is a near Earth asteroid called Itokawa, which was visited by a spacecraft called Hayabusa, launched by the Japanese Space Agency. This is from 2005. It's a pile of rocks. So I mentioned how these are reaccumulated debris from asteroid asteroid collisions, all the smaller ones. That gives us this rubble pile structure. You've got blocks of all different sizes that have loosely reconsolidated on each other. There is some cohesion here. There are some solid bricks. This large block here, for instance, there's another one on the other side. But other than that, you have this object that's 540 meters, a third of a mile long, and it's got a whole distribution of rubble here from blocks 80, 100 meters wide all the way down to dust. And despite that, it still has some geology happening. You look at this, you notice first it's not round. It looks like two pieces came together very, very, very slowly and they rested on each other. But somewhere in there, something sorted out the surface very efficiently. There's the ends here and the high zones that don't have any fine dust in them. And then there's these dust ponds that settle down in the low spots. So something, there's no wind, there's no air, there's no water flowing. Something's very efficiently sorted out all the dust. I talk about electrostatic charge, maybe that's what's going on here, lifting the material, settle, it settles it back down. You talk about impacts coming in, micrometeorites hitting and shaking the entire asteroid and jiggling the material around that can sort things out by size. You can have some other strange effects, radiation pressure, thermal expansion, contraction, cycling things. Again, not stuff that matters as much for geology on the earth, but on these small things, that's the dominant process. One thing that we understand happens a lot with asteroids like Hirokawa is something called the yarkovsky okeefe redzvetsky paddock effect, which asteroid astronomers universally abbreviate as YORP. This was worked out by a series of scientists by those four names over most of the 20th century. The idea is the asteroids out there in space, the free fall and microgravity, because it's the only thing around it is its own gravity. It's got the sunlight shining on it though. And the sunlight carries momentum, very little momentum, but it does carry some. And that sunlight getting absorbed, being re-emitted is infrared, being reflected back off can be a little bit offset from the center of the asteroid. And that can spin it up or can spin it down depending on the direction of the torque. So something like Itokawa may have spun up and broken into two pieces. Now the shape has changed, the radiation pressure has changed, and they may have very, very slowly recombined. And that's maybe how we get a contact binary shape like this. Or maybe it's a relic of the collision that formed the thing. There's only so much we can say with the data we have. But this again is another reason to study these things because they're very weird places, unlike anything we see on large planets. There is a third reason to study the near Earth asteroids. I talked about how the near Earth asteroid population we see is continuously being replaced from the main asteroid belt. Yes, where are the near Earth asteroids going that they need to be replaced? Or are, is that the amount of near Earth asteroids are steady, roughly speaking? Even as they're being replaced, they have to be lost somewhere. Well, their orbits can become more and more eccentric, and they eventually they fall into the sun or evaporate, coming too close to the sun. That's pretty exciting when you see it happen. They can fly by Jupiter again and get kicked out of the inner solar system completely. They can get hit by something and break apart. Radiation pressure can spin them up until they fly to pieces. It is also very exciting when it happens. Or they can hit something. Sometimes they hit a planet. Sometimes the planet is the Earth. This is the asteroid impact hazard. This is the, still from a video of somebody's home security camera outside the city of Chelyabinsk, if I'm remembering correctly. Although I may be misremembering it exactly where Alex Zajewski got this photo from. So look it up, it's on Flickr. And videos of this are all over YouTube. On the 15th of February, 2013, just around sunrise, an asteroid 15 to 20 meters across hit the atmosphere above the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. The fireball that produces all the kinetic energy from the asteroid's orbit around the sun and from its 
speed that it acquired by falling down through the Earth's gravity, all got converted into heat and light and sound. And the fireball was briefly as bright as the sun. The asteroid itself was turned into vapor and a lot of very, very small pieces. And you see the trail of steam from superheated air recondensing as it cools down. Nobody was killed by this thing, but there was a lot of people injured, mostly from broken glass, because the shockwave knocked out windows across the city. And we could not see this one coming. We would like to know about most things like this well enough in advance to at least be able to stay away from windows. We would like to know about larger things, which are less common, with more warnings so that we can hopefully do something about them. So something like Telebins kept it somewhere in the world once every few decades. The last one before this was in the 1960s in the Southern Ocean, several hundred kilometers off of Cape Town. People only noticed it because there was early satellite monitoring that had started at that point, making sure that nobody was setting off nuclear bombs. Somebody saw a really bright thermal flash in the data off the Southern Ocean, but there was no corresponding gamma emission which meant that it wasn't a bomb. It was an asteroid hitting the atmosphere. And these things get seen all the time. Mostly they're over the ocean. Mostly, don't mind too much. Very small ones. My colleague Peter Yuniskin at the City Institute runs towards the explosion rather than running away because he wants to pick up the meteorite thing and drop. But we'd still like to know about things like this if we can. And again, we'd like to know about the larger ones too. This is what happen, can, can happen when a larger asteroid hits. This is an object about 50 meters wide. This is Meteor Crater, Behringer Crater in Arizona. It's half a mile wide, 800 some meters. It's a pretty deep hole in the ground. And everything you see out here around the crater is the ejecta. All the rocks that were in the crater got thrown up and landed around the outside. And there have been even larger impacts in the history of the Earth. This is the Tixkalub impact crater in what is under what is currently the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. I say under because the, you can't actually see it that well at the current surface, but you can see it if you study the bedrock. Back in the 1980s, Louis and Walter Alvarez over at Cal, University of California, Berkeley, were trying to understand a strange property of rocks all around the world. You see 66 million year old rocks. You see dinosaur bones. You see this very thin layer of, in, in all the strata around the world. Then you see ro newer rocks with no dinosaur bones, except birds. That layer that shows up at that mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period is heavily enriched in ir iridium, which is an element that is very rare on the surface of the Earth. Because if you take the mixture of material that you make planets out of and make asteroids out of, and you build it all up into a planet, it melts. The, rock, the metal as sinks down to the middle and takes the iridium with it. So the Earth's core, which is mostly nickel and iron, has all, has all the iridium the Earth started with. They inferred somewhere in the world there was a big source of iridium that suddenly distributed itself everywhere. They inferred that it was probably an asteroid impact that caused this mass extinction event. And there should be a crater somewhere. And eventually it was found underneath the current surface in the Yucatan Peninsula. So here's the double ring of the impact crater. It's well over 100 kilometers wide underneath the current surface. It shows up in the bedrock on the ground if you know what to look for. There's fractures all through the limestone, which produces interesting caves. Something like this happens somewhere in the world once every 100 million years or so. We'd like to know make about that and make sure nothing like that is going to happen anytime soon. So this realization in the 1980s, combined then in the 1990s with the increased availability of CCD cameras, really motivated astronomers to go find as many asteroids as possible and track their orbits. That's gotten increasingly sophisticated with time. Here are a few examples of current and upcoming near-Earth asteroid surveys. The basic idea here is you cover as much of the sky as possible night if you're on the ground. If you're in space, you can look, observe whatever. And you look for everything that moves. And you set up your cadence so that you're tracking things that are moving at the speeds near the asteroids move across the sky. You don't care about satellites flying over. You want to avoid those. You don't care about hyperreal objects. They move too slowly. Although 
you will want to find Kuiper Belt objects, and also like to use a telescope to find Kuiper Belt objects. So there's negotiations that happen. But currently, the most active asteroid discovery projects are the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona and the Pan-STARS project, which operates telescopes on Haleakala in Maui. These are very prolific. They discover about 2,500 Earth asteroids per year. There are some other survey programs that are happening right now. The NEOWISE project searches from, for asteroids from orbit using a repurposed NASA spacecraft that was originally designed for astrophysics projects. The ATLAS project uses telescopes designed to sweep cover the entire night sky repeatedly. It's not looking for faint things, it's looking for things that are close and coming in. It can find most things like Chelyabinsk before they get here. Atlas had already been approved in 2013. It became significantly more popular after Chelyabinsk happened. The Vera Rubin Observatory, which is currently being built in Chile, is much larger telescope than the Catalina and Panstars projects. It also is entirely autonomous. autonomous. No human is actually involved in analyzing the data because there's too much of it. The Vera Rubin Observatory team has developed very, very good computer software that automatically finds things that moves in images. It just produces a series of alerts and then everybody, yeah, human astronomer spends their time doing follow-up. And that will come on in the next couple of years. So between all of these, which all the different surveys together occasionally get called Space Guard, which is a reference to an old Arthur C. Clarke novel, where people organize a survey after a large asteroid impact. The discovery rate for asteroids keeps on going up. You see here different surveys coming online and some of them eventually stopping. Discovery rate for asteroids goes up and up and up. This down here is the 2011 numbers. The year isn't over yet, they're still finding things. But what's going on here is mostly finding smaller and smaller asteroids. The initial goal for NASA was back in the 1990s, find everything on an Earth crossing orbit that's more than a kilometer wide, because that's sort of global impact effects. And you can see here, discovery rates for those things really go up in the late 1990s, more better CCDs is available. And then they dropped off dramatically since then early 2000s and are now basically zero. We found everything. It's a kilometer wide, it's on an Earth crossing orbit. None of them are going to impact the Earth anytime soon. There is one object which has a possible Earth impact in the year 2880 that we can't quite rule out yet. It has been bothering me for the last 15 years. Fortunately, we have plenty of time to rule that out too. But smaller impacts can still cause problems as Chelyabinsk has demonstrated. So the goal now is to push the survey limits much, much further down. Find things like Chelyabinsk with a few days to a few weeks of warning, find bigger things 100 meters across and up, in all possible orbits, and make sure none of them are going to hit the Earth anytime soon. If there are, then we can talk about asteroid deflection, which I'll get to towards the end. Now, when we find the asteroids, we want to characterize them and better understand their orbits. We also want to better understand their sizes and shapes and histories. There's the science motivations here. Are they, are, are they all ripple piles? They certainly look that way, but most of them anyway. What other properties do they have? But also from an impact hazard standpoint, you want to know what's the size and shape of the thing, what's its exact orbit and trajectory. Does it have little satellites in orbit around it? And then we have multiple asteroids to deflect for them in just one. And this is what my own work has focused on. I do mostly radar observations. You see up there the Goldstone Deep Space Network site in Southern California, which is NASA's deepest network. It's part primarily dedicated to communicating with spacecraft, but they have a high power transmitter mounted there and we can use it for looking at asteroids. I would also be showing the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, except that Arecibo collapsed last year and we will not be able to use the hardware there because it all fell down into the dish. I am not going to show that video tonight. I do not need to see it again myself. You can watch it if you want to, it's available. 
But when we can do asteroid radar observations, we get images like what you see here. So these are not normal pictures. We have the asteroid out in space. We time the flight of the radar signal going out. It hits the asteroid surface. It gets reflected back. We measure the time delay that that makes going out and back. And effectively getting slices across in distance from the Earth. As the asteroid spins, the Doppler shift on the echo, part of it relatively moving towards us, part of it going away, gives us a second dimension. So we get a series of pictures of the surface. But going from the images that you see here to shape models like this, 3D printing is fun, by the way, is a little bit tricky. But we know how to do it. So you see there at the top left, an object called 1982 UI4 with a million asteroids being tracked and 30,000 some near Earth asteroids. We stopped giving them names. Most of them just have telephone numbers. This one was discovered in 1982, hence the first part of the code. But this one, you can see it's a lumpy sphere with a bunch of rocks everywhere. A student working with me a couple of years ago, Nick Young, studied the distribution of the boulders, which are all the little bright dots you see here, and found they don't appear to be clustered in any way on the surface of UY4, unlike Idokawa, where they were sorted out some. So there's differences between the different asteroids. We also have Asteroids that have that contact binary shape like Itokawa, but do it a bit differently. 2000 RS11, you see here. Another student working with me some years ago, Kaylee Brower, produced this shape model of RS11. It's not the shape the same as Itokawa. It has the two pieces, but they're arranged differently. This is Itokawa, the small piece would be on the end. I don't know how you form this shape. And then the last example you see there in the lower right is called 1984 CC. This one is a triple asteroid system. There's a single spinning primary asteroid, which looks kind of like this. And then there's these two little dots in front of them behind the main asteroid. So we have now a triple asteroid system. These are very interesting scientifically because they tell us the mass and density of the thing. We measure the orbit, you apply Kepler's laws. They also tell us stuff about how Europe spins up the asteroids and they shed material around their equators and get satellites. And they are important for impact hazards considerations because if you are needed to deflect something, you'd like to know is there one asteroid or two or three that you have to deal with, as I mentioned before. Now we can tell quite a lot about many different asteroids from the ground using radar, using infrared, using visible light, but we can only do so much. We get a lot more if you send spacecraft out to asteroids. And because the asteroids are easy to get to, there have been a lot of asteroid spacecraft missions. Parts of this slide are getting cut off. I apologize. There's just too much stuff on here. I keep even having to add asteroid spacecraft. This is a good problem to have. There have been three near Earth asteroid missions that have already happened over the past 20 something years. The first was by NASA, the near Shoemaker spacecraft, which went to, orbited, and landed on the near-Earth asteroid Eros. I mentioned the Hayabusa mission by JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, which landed on the asteroid Yokawa and brought back a small amount of dust. That is the other side of Yokawa, which you saw before. In 2012, the Chang'e 2 spacecraft, which was part of the Chinese Space Agency's Lunar Mission Series, after surveying landing sites on the moon for Chang'e 3, 4, and 5, it was navigated out of Earth-Moon space entirely to fly by an asteroid called Teutatus. We had made a shape model of Teutatus before from radar images. It looks pretty close to how it actually looks. We'd also predicted where Teutatus was in space and how it was spinning. This turned out to be important because I had not realized that they were planning on flying Tonga to quite so close to Teutatus. They ended up going 800 meters, half a mile off of the surface of Teutatus, which is about five kilometers, three miles long. Fortunately, our models for where it was and how it was spinning were correct, and there was no collision. And they got a very nice series of images. There are two asteroid missions that are happening right now. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft, which is a project by JAXA and the European Space Agency, with some assistance from groups in the United States and Australia and some other places landed on the asteroid Ryugu, took samples from on its surface and below its surface, brought those samples back to the Earth, 
I'll talk more about those in a moment. And then it is on its way now to another asteroid, 1998 KY26, in an extended emission. I apologize for background noise. OSIRIS-REx is a NASA mission with contributions from the Canadian Space Agency and then collaborations with people in Japan and Australia and Europe. It has gone to the asteroid Bennu and collected samples and may do an extended mission to another asteroid called Apophis. Apophis is interesting because until this year, it had a series of possible Earth impacts in the later part of this century. Those have now been ruled out, it, but it will make a very close flyby of the Earth in 2029, which ends up being convenient for OSIRIS-REx rendezvousing with it. Other asteroid missions that are going forward, NEA Scout is a NASA technology demonstration. It will go where, whichever asteroid it can get to. It's doing a ride share on its launch. It doesn't know exactly when they'll go up. The DART and HERA missions by NASA and ESA will go to a binary asteroid called Didymos. I'll talk more about those in a moment. The Destiny Plus mission from JAXA is supposed to go to asteroid 3200 Phaethon, which is the source of the Gemini meteor shower. It goes very close to the sun and then it spalls off material into space because it gets superheated. That's kind of exciting. We have the proposed missions here. I may want to move up Zonghe, which is hopefully to go forward with the Chinese Space Agency. That is to go to an asteroid called Kamaola Lewa, which is an interesting one. It's spinning very fast every half an hour. That means it has to have some amount of cohesion holding it together, or it would fly apart into space because the gravity is so low. It also has the peculiarity that if you're gonna collect samples from such a thing, you have to approach it very carefully along the spin axis, or you're gonna go flying off the surface as you try to land. Yanis is a NASA mission going forward, which should go to a couple of different binary asteroids. So there's many different groups of people doing many different space missions to many different objects. I wanna emphasize here how collaborative all of this is. No one country or group of people can make these things work, we work together, we can do some cool stuff. Excuse me a moment. I apologize for the noise. That was an unplanned interruption. The DART mission, a double asteroid redirection test, is a project led by NASA. The, but funded by NASA, led by Cheryl Reed at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. The idea here is to demonstrate asteroid deflection. If we find an asteroid that's big enough to be worth deflecting, as opposed to telling people to stay away from windows, that's on an impact trajectory, we wish to demonstrate deflection by moving it out of the way. We need some way of validating that we know how to do this. We will propose many different ways of moving asteroids around. One of them is called kinetic impact or deflection. You have asteroid out in space, you hit it with a hammer, you shove it out of the way. The hammer in this case is spacecraft, massing as much as you can, you impact as fast as you possibly can. And you change the asteroid's velocity very, very slightly. The, re the velocity change you apply is the ratio of the mass of the spacecraft to the asteroid times the velocity of a spacecraft going 10,000 meters per second, you impact the surface. The asteroid has a billion times as much mass. You change the orbit here by a fraction of a millimeter per second. But that may be enough to move the asteroid off course if you have many years of notice. So the idea here is for DART to launch at the end of this year. It will fly out to the binary asteroid Didymos, it will actually impact the satellite Dimorphos because it's smaller. And also it will change the orbital period of Dimorphos around Didymos. And that change will be measured from the Earth. There'll be a CubeSat provided by Italian Space Agency flying along with the main spacecraft. It will fly past and see the impact. DART will be destroyed on impact. All the pieces will not be vaporized, but they'll be rendered into very, very, very small pieces. The question becomes, how much momentum do you apply to the surface of the asteroid? And exactly how much is unclear, because the ejecta that you shoot off on the impact will also change things. 
So we use to measure that velocity change to demonstrate we have at least one way of validating moving asteroids around. There are other approaches people talk about for moving asteroids, gravity tractors, radiation pressure, solar sails. I can talk about those in the question time if you want to. But this is the most basic technique for moving asteroids around. That's what's going to be tested 17 months from now. Note that Deimos cannot hit the Earth any time in the foreseeable future. And it will actually be pushed slightly further away from the, astero the asteroid from the Earth during the impact. And people check, we're not going to create an impact hazard. We'll practice how to deal with the impact hazard. To finish up here, I'm going to talk about Hayabusa 2 and Osiris Rex. And all credit here goes to the respective mission teams. I just want to feature this stuff because it is really cool. The asteroid Ryugu has this spinning top shape, which we infer is due to asteroids radiation pressure torque spinning up and they bulge out around the middle. But it's not actually spinning that fast right now. It spun back down again at some point, sort of random walks in station rate. But they landed on the surface just about where that arrow is, just off the equatorial ridge, collected samples, put them in a container. And they have this touch and go sampling system. They also have this small carry on impactor, which you may probably can't read on the screen here. That was a big disk of copper with an explosive charge behind it. Release that from the spacecraft, set it off, and shoot it towards the asteroid. The idea here is just to dig a hole. It's very hard to dig a hole using a shovel, but the gravity is 10,000 times as low as it is on the Earth because your shovel wouldn't actually go into the surface, the spacecraft would go up into space. So instead, they just shoved the explosive charge at the surface and slammed the copper disc into it. And that dug out a hole a couple of meters deep and they took samples from the bottom of the hole. They packaged both of those up, brought them back to Earth. You see there the sample container on the bottom of a parachute landing in the Womera range in Australia. And then from there, it was taken to Tokyo and opened up and it's going to get analyzed atom by atom. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft from NASA took a different approach to Hayabusa 2. The goal here was to collect just one sample, but to get as much sample as possible. So they landed on the asteroid Bennu, which different mix of carbonaceous material from Ryugu, different history, but very similar shape, equatorial bulge. It found a relatively flat spot, touched down on the surface, fired a jet of nitrogen, into the surface while firing rockets to keep the spacecraft in place at the same time. And that blew up a huge amount of material and piled it all into the sample container here. The spacecraft then goes back up to a safe altitude. It took this video showing material escaping back out from the sample container into space because there's just so much of it that got collected. Good problems to have, again. At that point, the Cyrus Rex team ordered the container to be stowed into the sample return container here. Very tight aero shell. So it can survive passes through the Earth's atmosphere and be intact and pristine when it hits the ground. It will not get damaged in the process or contaminated. This is planetary protection concerns, not wanting the Earth to mess up the sample. And then they're on their way back to Earth now with those rocks. They flew by Bennu on the way back one more time, took photos of the collection site. That jet of nitrogen and the Russian rockets from the spacecraft apparently threw around a one metric ton block along with a lot of other rubble. So again, unusual physics. The gravity is so low here, you can talk about moving one ton rocks by spraying a bit of nitrogen on them. Okay. I want to allow plenty of time for questions. I think we can do that. I covered quite a lot of stuff from the early history of the solar system all the way through to different near Earth asteroids, the impact hazard, a bunch of different spacecraft. And I will we'll probably stop the screen sharing if that is okay, although I can turn it back on if that helps you ask your questions and me to answer them. All right, we did uh, receive a couple questions so far, so we can go ahead and jump right in. Um, now, sorry if I say this incorrectly, was Bennu a, a Pophos, the asteroid, which was to pass closer than the distance between the Earth and the moon? If so, could the gravity or gravities that it may be passing through have a huge effect on its orbit? 
So Bennu and Apophis are two very different asteroids. Bennu is about 500 meters wide, bulged out around the equator and made of carbonaceous chondrite. You saw the pictures there. Apophis is quite a bit smaller. It's much more regularly shaped and it's made of just rocks. There's no carbon or oxygen, no, no carbon or water, sorry. It just happens that it's on a convenient orbit for the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft to intercept. The reason it's convenient is that Apophis will be passing very, very close to the Earth in 2029, quite a lot closer than the moon. It will, in fact, be closer to the Earth than the satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth. And it's going to be well south out of that orbit plane, so it's not at risk for running into anything. Apophis's orbit will be very strongly perturbed by the Earth and the Moon during the flyby. Fortunately, we know the mass of the Earth very well, the Earth's gravity field very well. We know the Moon's mass and gravity field very well. We can account for all of that. The biggest uncertainty in Pitkin Apophis's orbit until this past couple of months even was the effects of radiation pressure on the asteroid pushing it around. We now have very good measurement of that. Also hard to measure is just uncertainty in how fast it's moving. And you can get that better measurements two ways, better measurement of where the asteroid is and just more time. And then any slight initial change in velocity will correspond to a bigger change of position. Apophis was discovered in 2004. We now have 17 years worth of data and can pretty precisely say where it's going and it's not gonna impact the earth anytime soon. Even allowing for all the perturbations from the earth and the moon over the next and everything else in the solar system over the next century. Thank you. I'm just pulling up the other questions that came up just a moment. One moment, sorry. All right. Um, how confident are you that the dimorphos will be deflected rather than breaking up? So Dimorphos is 100 some meters across. The amount of energy the DART spacecraft coming in will deposit is many thousands of times less than the amount of energy just from gravity holding Dimorphos together. It's not gonna be enough to break it to pieces. It may be enough to kick up quite a lot of ejecta, throw that out into space. And exactly how much it kicks up is an important thing that the project will be trying to measure. All right, I'm waiting for a couple, let's see if there's any more questions. Those are the two that came through so far. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, at Chabot Space and Science Center, our telescope Nelly is actually one of, um, it's one of the telescopes that is doing some of the research uh, for near, near Earth objects. And so it's one of, it's actually part of the network of observatories that's searching and tracking for near Earth asteroids. And it's been registered with the International Astronomical Union and has submitted more than 1,600 um, new, new earth, uh, new earth, uh, near Earth object data sets. So I just wanted to mention that it's pretty exciting that Chavo gets to be a part of that research a little bit as well. So there is a global network of both amateur and professional astronomers who do follow-up observations. I mentioned how we have certain discovery programs that are finding thousands of these things. They fit the orbits as best they can, but for, particularly for the ones that are potentially hazardous, you want as much data as possible. So it's very good that lots of people are spending lots of time. There's always somebody who has got clear sky and darkness to go follow up everything that's been discovered. Yeah, it's very exciting. Our astronomers are, can be involved in that. Um, well, it looks like we don't have any more questions at this time. I was going to give folks a little more time, um, but I don't see that anymore coming in. But thank you so much for taking the time to explain this to us. It was very intriguing. We had a lot of comments about how intriguing this is, and it's, you know, sort of scary to hear about, you know, all the things that are coming close to our Earth, but exciting to know that those things are being tracked and, 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 you know, for a long time now, and so we're safe, you know, for the near future, but it's very, very interesting research. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Thank you. For I was just me. wondering if I could ask Michael, what, what next? What, what do you, what do you, what do you, what are your goals? If you had a budget of, of not that limited amount. What, what would you like to do? Uh, where would you like to explore next? So as far as there these are things? a lot of things that are going forward. Happening this week, actually, there's something called the Planetary Defense Conference, which happens every couple of years. And it's lots of people talking about how do we 
better what do we do next for best addressing the impact hazard mm -hmm. part of what needs to happen is to be finding and tracking everything and for that the survey programs that are going on i mentioned the rubin observatory there's also a project called near earth object surveillance surveyor mission which would go up into space and do a survey going much closer to the sun than we can do from the ground and that really speeds up the process of finding asteroids and earth across the orbits because you can find things that are inwards much more easily than if you're annoying sunlight and air in the way. Mm -hmm. so that'd be cool to see. There was also some years ago a pro proposal called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. This proposes to demonstrate a different form of asteroid deflection called the gravity tractor. So you have asteroid out in space. I have this shape model here because there's an object called 2008 EB5, which we observed with radar, which was the proposed target for the asteroid redirect mission. The idea is you go out here and you, and you hover above the asteroid and you angle your rocket exhaust so that it misses the surface. Now, there's gravity pulling you towards the asteroid. Newton's third law is the asteroid is also being pulled towards you. Again, this is not something we normally think about. You don't think about moving a mountain by standing over here and it falls towards you. But if you're already in free fall around the sun, you've got enough time, this can work. The rocket exhaust goes that way. It has to be a specially designed rocket that runs very, very low thrust for a very, very, very long time. And just careful formation flying, pull the entire asteroid off course. This has a few advantages over the kinetic impactor. It doesn't care what the internal structure is. It doesn't care how the thing is spinning. There's no risk of breaking things apart. It has the disadvantage that it is really, really slow. NASA proposed to demonstrate this going to the asteroid 2000 EV-5. They needed a spacecraft that masked several tons and over six months, it would pull the asteroid about this far, 400 some meters, the size of the asteroid. Mm -hmm. Again, if you compound that out over 10 years of time, if you have that much notice of an actual impact, that's enough you can change the orbit by thousands of kilometers. Mm -hmm. I would like to see a gravity tractor demonstration at some point, that could be cool but it's $1 billion worth of spacecraft, which is several times more expensive than the DART project. <laughs> so far, nobody has decided to invest in that. Mm -hmm. and maybe there's better things to do, but it will be cool to see at some point. Maybe another close call and people will be willing to spend the money. We'll see. <laughs> um, I just want to ask one more question before we wrap up. And that I, I've got the picture of the Arecibo Observatory with that I took way, way back when. And of course, that uh, had the benefit of, of, of incredible, uh, incredibly powerful radar to, to, to make the, the surface mapping that, that you have done. And you say that the Goldstone uh, uh, dish is doing that currently. Is there any plans to, to, to build something either to replace Arecibo in terms of power or to even you know, uh, rebuild Arecibo? I'm sure some people are wondering about that. So the Arecibo Observatory, for those not familiar with the original. It's 300 meters, 1,000 feet wide, spherical reflector built into a sinkhole in limestone in Puerto Rico. Built there because there was a conveniently circularly shaped sinkhole. And then you put up a series of towers and then you have a platform and you move around the transmitter and receiver, receivers on that platform around a circle back and forth. You can't look at things way off to the sides with this design because you can't tilt the dish. So the advantage is that it's very, very sensitive because you've got so much collecting area. The disadvantage is you can only see a certain fraction of the sky. Mm -hmm. There is a larger radio telescope than Arecibo that has been built. This is the 500 meter spherical, aperture spherical telescope, FAST, which is built in China in another large sinkhole. FAST cannot have a transmitter mounted on there because when they designed it, they wanted to be able to see way off to the sides, not so far as to tilt the dish, but further than Arecibo. And it can't handle a really big weight up there because then you would need huge counter mass, just if a big torque from on your platform, it rip the cables. So FAST can't have a transmitter. It's very sensitive, but it can't have a transmitter. There's been some discussions of doing bi-static radar observations. You transmit somewhere else that you receive with FAST. I have limited information there because I am paid by NASA and I have restrictions on what I can ask Chinese radio astronomers directly, which is 
complicated. There are other radio telescopes that have transmitters, mostly for spacecraft communications. NASA has the Goldstone Deep Space Network site, which has the most sensitive radar that we have now that Arecibo is not available. But that's a 70 meter dish. It's 10 times less sensitive than Arecibo was, more than that. We can receive with the 100 meter Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, and that's more sensitive. But then we have to schedule two telescopes at the same time, which gets a little tricky. There are other spacecraft communication radio transmitters you could use for radar stuff. Some in Europe, some in Australia. Maybe some of the stuff in Argentina, if I think about it. But there's a, there's a list we have. It. And there's different groups of people that are trying radar observations, but there is nothing equivalent to Arecibo yet. There's proposals to stick a much higher power transmitter on the Green Bank Telescope that would be comparable to Arecibo. But to do that, you have to go to much higher frequency. And then you run into complications that whenever it rains, the signal strength goes way down. Because long wavelength, like Arecibo was working at 12.6 centimeters. That doesn't care about raindrops. If you're working at a few millimeters, then the rain starts to matter. So Green Bank might have a transmitter, but performance would not be guaranteed. There is a proposal from the Arecibo Observatory to rebuild Arecibo. And this proposal does not actually have a platform or towers in the current design. Instead, it has about a thousand smaller dishes all filling the inside of the sinkhole. At this point, the sinkhole is mostly convenient because you already have all the infrastructure for operating a telescope and it blocks off all of, some of the radio frequency interference from the surroundings. And then you can look at much larger sections of the sky and your sensitivity could be okay. But then you have a software problem. You have 1,000 some different radio telescopes and you have to link them all together and very precisely control the signal that you're transmitting out of all of them. This does get done with some filled aperture flat panel arrays for radar transmissions for aircraft monitoring and other things because it's easier to not have a big parabola antenna coming off the side of your airplane. But nothing on the scale of Arecibo, 300 meters wide. So the technology may be there, it may not be. There needs to be, we need to be some careful studies as to can this actually be done. Rebuilding Arecibo like that would cost a few hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. It is not clear where the money would come from <laughs> at this point. Yeah. The National Science Foundation and NASA and Congress have negotiations that are happening about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll so, so hope, hopefully, but, but nothing yet to replace that, that grand old telescope. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Were there any last minute questions that came through? We had another question come in. Um, someone asked if there's an, any asteroids that might impact the moon. So the impact forecasts for the run for NASA by the Solar System Dynamics Group at the Propulsion Laboratory that are run by the NEODIS group at Frascati outside Rome for the European Space Agency, and also the Minor Planet Center and some independent groups that are also, everybody can do the same math on the same data sets do look for collisions between everything. So not just things that might hit the Earth, things that might hit other stuff. People have predicted in advance that things were going to hit Jupiter. This was back in the 1990s with Shoemaker Levy 9. And that was so be dramatic. <laughs> People have predicted there are possible impacts with Mars. There was a comet a few years ago that did not hit Mars, but it passed very close. And that mattered for spacecraft doing Mars observations. They didn't want an unscheduled meteor shower. So they arranged all the spacecraft were on the far side of Mars when the comet's tail passed by Mars. I don't recall anybody predicting impacts onto the moon in advance of them happening. We certainly have seen impacts onto the moon because very small things that would be stopped high in the Earth's atmosphere, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so they just smash down into the ground and you can see very brief flashes if you're looking at the dark side of the moon. But I don't recall anybody predicting impacts onto the moon in advance. The moon is a pretty, it's pretty small as compared to the Earth or even Mars. So it's a little less likely. Thank you so much. I think that's all the questions that have come in. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for the invitation. And I apologize for background noise. 
Oh, that's all right. I think uh, someone said they heard a few a future astrophysicists in the background. <laughs> um, really nice, really nice to have you. And thank you to the SETI Institute for partnering with us um, and uh, on these virtual talks. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, it's been a wonderful um, to have these talks for families. I'm just enjoying the content of these talks as well. Thank you again, Dr. Bush. Right. And thank you for Simon. Thank you, Simon, for being with us as well. Um, I just want to mention that the SETI Institute and Chabot Space and Science Center are both uh, nonprofit organizations. And during this time, we appreciate your support more than ever. Please consider making a donation to the SETI Institute at SETI.org and to Chabot Space and Science Center at ChabotSpace.org. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. All right.